All right, all right. How was the feeling, everybody? The exam is very, very, very close, isn't it? And I, I think, I mean, if I was in your place, I definitely must have been a little bit scared. But uh, how are you guys doing? Uh, how are you all feeling? Like, is is it good? Is it how how how? What is the you know scenario at your home? Everybody seems to be a little tense. How is it? Do let me know in the comment section. Do let me know in the chat section. But like I always say, everybody, andari ki namaskaram, elar guswagatam. This is me, your master teacher, Navamita Bharachaji, and today we are going to go for a complete formula revision of physical chemistry. Because the formulas are in physical chemistry. There is, there is hardly any formula in inorganic chemistry. But in, in organic chemistry, we have exceptions that I'll be covering in a separate video. Don't worry about it. And uh, about organic, that will be covered by Pahul sir. So don't worry about that as well. Now, without much further ado, guys, let us start with the session. Because I know that it is, uh, the time is of essence right now, isn't it? Yes. We have to say, save time, everybody. We have to save time. And that is why, everyone, I am not going to look at the chat at all today. Yes, I'm not going to talk to you because I feel like if I talk to you, it's going to be time-based. And, uh, you know, those students who are going to study just before exam, if I'm talking to you and if you, when you are revising, it will look very weird and you won't like it. You won't find the class too interesting. So, I'm not going to talk to you. And I will just start with today's session all right so in today's session my dear student here is a little bit of the content that i'm going to show you here we are going to complete some basic concepts in chemistry boleto that means that this is your which chapter this is your mole concept chapter yes mole concept and stoichiometry chapter if you remember yes so this is that one after that we will be covering atomic structure chemical bonding and molecular structure chemical thermodynamics solutions equilibrium redox and chemical kinetics these are the chapters that are included in your physical chemistry and we are going to take a look at each and every formula of uh, you know from these uh, chapters so everybody ready all right now you don't really have to write it down but sit with me make sure that you are listening to the session because that will be a good revision and if you do not remember something then let me know in the comment section maybe i will be able to make a trick out of it but whatever tricks and tips whatever i know i will be definitely telling you all all right so, chalo, let us start with today's session and obviously as we start with today's session, we will be starting with, first of all, we will be starting with the mole concept, right? Now, in the mole concept, the first thing that we talk about is, I'm pretty sure that you all know and it is your, what is it, everybody, the carbon scale, isn't it? Yes, it is the carbon scale that we are going to talk about right away right now so let us start everyone what is this carbon scale guys what is this carbon scale that we talk about in your mole concept the carbon scale is the average relative mass of an atom of an element as it is compared to the mass of the car mass of a carbon atom yes and and which carbon by the way carbon 12 isotope not nothing else no other other carbon you can't take carbon 13 or carbon 14 it has to be carbon 12 all right so let me write that down what did i say i said that it is the average it is the average relative mass of an atom okay of an atom of an element of an element as compared to as compared to the mass of an atom of carbon of carbon c12 which is taken as 12 by the way yes which is taken as 12 right we all know this now, let us talk about a formula that is relative atomic mass, everybody. What is your relative atomic mass? And your relative atomic mass, everybody, is mass of one atom of an element. Exactly what I have written in the definition right now. It is mass of one atom of an element divided by 1 by 12 mass of one atom of carbon. All right. If I write it down, maybe it will be easier for you. So, have a look, everybody. I'm writing it down here. Yes. By the way, let me also tell you that I'm not going to write each and every formula. Some of them are already written because if I keep writing, guys, you have to understand that a two-hour session can be, a, you know, four or six years long. Also, it's a formula revision. So, I will be anyway giving you the PDF. Don't worry about it. Just stick here. Okay. All right. So, mass of one atom, mass of one atom of an element all right yes 
divided by 1 by 12 multiplied with mass of one atom of carbon. Which carbon? C12 everybody. Can you see? Yes? All righty then. All righty. Yes. Now let us understand what is one mole. When we say that one mole and in this whole chapter that is mole concept, mole concept, mole, mole concept, we keep talking about mole a lot. So the question that comes into our mind is what is one mole everybody and whenever we say one mole you have to understand that it represents yes one mole represents or one mole is is uh, you know one mole is represented in the form of atoms molecules and ions okay one mole let me write that uh, write it down this way one mole is represented as one mole is represented as or represented in the form of in the form of atoms, molecules and ions. As, as what? Now everybody, each one of you write it down in the chat box and I know that I want to see, yes, very good. Na particles, that means how much? That means Na particles means 6.022 into 10 to the power 23 particles. And my dear students, when we say particles, we can also write it as entities, you know. Entities just becomes a little sophisticated word, by the way. But anyway, what does it mean? When we write entities here, that means that it can be electron, it can be proton, it can be atoms, it can be ions, it can be molecules, it can be neutrons, etc., etc., etc. It can be any of these things, okay? It can be any of these things. Do you, do you understand this? Do you understand this, everybody? Great. Okay. Now, let us understand what is gram atomic mass. What are we going to understand? We're going to understand what is gram atomic mass. Okay. What is gram atomic mass, everybody? And we are going to abbreviate it as G-A-M. That means gram. Okay. All right. So what is gram atomic mass? Gram atomic mass, everybody, is the atomic mass of an element when we express it in grams. That's it. That's it. Nothing else. What is it? What did I say? It is, it is the atomic mass. Yes, it is the atomic mass of an element, of an element expressed in grams. All right. Expressed in grams. All right. That's it, everybody. That's it. That's it that you have to know about gram atomic mass. Okay. All right, now we're going to understand what is gram molecular mass, okay? What is gram molecular mass or something that we abbreviate it as GMM, all right? Gram molecular mass, everybody, gram molecular mass or we abbreviate it as GMM, everyone. Yes, this is it. What is gram molecular mass? Similar, absolutely similar, everybody. It is the molecular mass of a substance expressed in grams. That's it. It is the molecular mass expressed in grams all right that's it so gram molecular mass is, is equal to gram molecules and gram molecular masses of all the gases contain 6.022 into 10 to the power 23 number of molecules at standard temperature of pressure okay all right, everybody. Now, guys, let us understand one thing. What are the applications of this mole concept? When we keep talking about mole concept or why do we think that this chapter is so important? By the way, let me tell you that this chapter is actually not very high weighted chapter. You can expect only maybe one or two questions from this chapter in each shift. Not more than that, definitely. But this chapter is very important because it is utilized in your solutions chapter and it is also utilized in a lot of other chapters as well like equivalent weight when we talk about equivalent weight in redox reactions we also have to know about molecular masses we also have to know about these things okay that we are studying in this chapter hence it is very important and by the way please stick for at least like the next one hour because i am going to tell you some very very important formula some very very important you know interconvertible terms that is going to be absolutely necessary for you to solve your problems okay all right guys now moving on here let us talk about the applications of your mole concept okay applications of mole concept 
So what, where, where do we use mole concept or why do we even have it? First of all, everyone, number one thing, okay? Number one, everybody. Okay, I will be needing some more pages. Can you imagine how much do I write? Here we go. All right, yes. So <laughs> just a second, guys, yes. Yeah, now it's, I think it's perfect. So number one, if we want to find out the mass of one atom, okay? If we want to find out the mass of one atom, then what do we do here? We are going to write it down as the formula here. This is where the formula starts, everybody. Pay attention, guys, okay? So atomic mass or or you can write it as or you can write it as gram atomic weight okay or or gram atomic weight i'm writing it as gaw divided by what i forgot to remember which is 6.022 into 10 to the power 23 some places you will also see it as 6.023 okay doesn't matter it will be given to you in the problem and many are times in the problem that you get in your jee the given data will be given. So they will ask you what value you have to take for Avogadro constant, whatever value is given, take that. All right, yes. Now guys, number two, yes, don't laugh. <laughs> Just because I said number two, don't laugh. Now, mass of one molecule, okay, mass of one molecule. And how do we calculate that? Yes, very simple, very easy. Absolutely, you guessed it, right? What is it? Molecular mass, yes. All you have to do is take molecular mass here, molecular mass and divide it by Yes, absolutely right. 6.023 into 10 to the power 23. Okay, cool. Now, let's say you want to calculate the number of atoms that is given, you know, or maybe in the question, suppose in the question, it is asked to you that calculate this, this much moles are present of this element, blah, blah, element, calculate the number of atoms that, are, that is present in the given sample. How are you going to do it? You are going to take, my dear students, yes, number of atoms, everybody, number of atoms is, is equal to moles multiplied with 6.023 into 10 to the power 23 understanding everybody please quickly write down in the chat box hashtag epbt i need to know everybody and please do not mind and don't think that ma'am is not talking to you don't think that why ma'am you are not solving my doubt ma'am why don't do all of that please understand that now right now today is not about solving the doubt because if you're still asking me asking me doubt too late the ship has sailed everybody Pay attention, write down the formulas. If you do not know something, if I'm saying something important, make a note out of it, okay? All right? And don't keep talking about this thing. And mom, you're not talking only. Mom, you're not taking my name only. I will not take today everybody, anybody's name and I'm not going to have a conversation with you because time is of essence, like I said, okay? So moles multiplied with 6.023 into 10 to the power 23 will give you number of atoms. Also, one more thing. Why am I not talking to you? That's because... I just thought of a reason. Yes, I also want to make sure that all the formulas are given to you in a very concise time. So get back, everybody. Get back. Okay. This will be also equal to this. We can also write it as understand this mass of substance. Okay. Mass of substance in grams. All right. Mass of substance in grams multiplied with 6.023 into 10 to the power 23 divided by what? Gram molecular mass, my dear students. Yes. What is it? Gram molecular mass, everybody. Yes. Writing it down. Now, what if I want to calculate the number of molecules that are present with me? Okay. Or number of molecules that are present in a given sample, everybody. How am I going to do that? So number of molecules will be equal to once again, very simple, very easy. Moles multiplied with 6.023 into 10 to the power 23 divided by, no divided by. Moles multiplied with 6.023 multiplied with 10 to, 10 to the power 23. Please tell me guys, is, is this much clear to you all? Yes, I hope that you are not finding any doubt till here because everything is very simple, very easy, okay? So now you can also equival, equate it with molecular mass or or gram molecular weight okay gram molecular weight divided by why am i writing or as of today i do not know maybe i am off today <laughs> 6.023 into 10 to the power 23 okay this is another application of your mole you know the mole concept everybody yes the mole concept all right now moving on everybody moving on let's say that what if what if we want to 
Is there anything else left? Number of moles of molecules, number of moles of atoms, I've told you. Ha, ha, ha. No, no, no. That's not done. Chal, ha. Now, let's say that you want to find out number of moles of atom. Yes. In the question, in the question, everything is almost given to you and you just have to calculate the number of moles of atoms. What will you do? The given mass in the question, in the question, in the problem, you will be given some amount of mass. So write that. And what do you write it as? You will write it as given mass divided by atomic weight. Okay, given mass divided by atomic weight. And this given mass will be in what? What will be the unit of it? The unit everybody will be gram. Got, got it? Got it clear? All right, number six. Yes, number of moles of molecules, everybody. What is it? Number of moles of molecules. How do you calculate that? Number of moles of molecules is calculated as a weight of the substance. That means, once again, everybody, instead of writing two different terms i'm writing it as weight of the substance no i'm writing it as given mass okay i'm writing it as given mass divided by molecular mass okay this is very 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 easy and this is very useful by the way this is very useful in most of the questions you will have to find out what is the number of moles of molecules or what is the number of moles of atoms so it it, it, it becomes very handy right yes now, going, moving forward, everybody, let us say that if we are asked to find out, okay, let's say that we are asked to find the mass average. We are asked to find the average mass, okay? So, how do you do that? Yes, how do you do that, everybody? Average mass, you calculate it as, my dear students, it, it's equal to, yes, let, 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 let's say that there are n moles of some molecule that is present. Okay, let us say that n one mole of molecules are present and the molecular mass of substance 1 is m1, molecular mass of substance 2 is m2. Not, not substance 2, sorry. The molecule, the n2, there is another sample which has n2 mole of molecules with molecular mass m2. Then you will be calculating average mass as n1, m1 plus N2 capital M2 divided by total moles that is N1 plus N2. Getting it? Is this clear? All clear everybody? Great. Now we come across something that is absolutely very simple and that my dear students is percentage composition of a compound. Yes, look at this. I have already com uh, completed more than, 10 uh, more than 10 formulas everyone. Yes. Now, let us talk about percentage composition. What is it? Percentage composition. Yes, composition of a compound. What is percentage a composition of a compound? Percentage composition. Let us calculate it. <clears throat> or let us write down the formula here, everyone. Yes, what do we have? We have percentage composition by mass. That's what we want to calculate, isn't it? Percentage composition by mass and that my dear student is equal to weight of element in one molecule of a compound divided by gram molecular weight of the compound multiplied with 100 that means that that means that i am writing it down here weight wt means weight okay all right let me move this side everybody so weight of the element weight of the element in one molecule of you know what let me write it here at the bottom sorry it's it's taking too much space that's why yeah so i'm gonna write this down here weight of the compound okay weight of the element sorry weight of the element in one molecule in one molecule of a compound of a compound divided by gram molecular weight of the compound okay divided by gram molecular weight of the compound multiplied with 100 why because percentage composition right percentage is written here right here so that is why we will have to use it as it is okay now, my dear students, here, let's move a little forward. So, all these things I have already told you. Now, sabse important, hashtag most important, everybody, is this Y diagram, my bachus. This Y diagram is going to be absolutely 
it, it's going to be your absolutely at your fingertips formula and i know my students like atomic and luxury hitler and all of these students they come every day to my session and they tell me that in fact atomic had told me that ma'am this y diagram is crazy good and that is why once again i'm telling you everybody so let us say let us say everybody that you are given number of particles okay you are given that this sample has this 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 many number of atoms and you want to calculate mole okay what do you want to calculate you want to calculate how many moles of that how many moles of that entities or how many moles of the, that particle is present all you have to do is if number of particles is given to you and you want to find out mole then you divide it by avogadro number all right yes now if moles are given to you and you have to calculate number of particles all you do is multiply it with avogadro number now let's say that mole is given to you and you have to calculate the mass of the sample then all you have to do is multiply it with the molar mass if mass of the sample is given to you and you have to calculate the mole what are you going to do you are going to divide it by the molar mass okay if moles are given to you and you are asked the volume of gas at stp stp means standard temperature and pressure wherein temperature is zero degree celsius and what is your and what is your yeah yeah come on come on what is your pressure your pressure is one bar what is the difference between stp and ntp at ntp you have zero degree celsius temperature but your pressure right here is one atm and we all know that one atmospheric pressure is equal to 1.013 bar okay so that's the difference between ntp and stp everybody all right yes now if you are given the mole and you have to calculate the volume of the gas at standard temperature and pressure all you have to do is divide it by 22.4 liters because we know that a gas one mole of any gas occupies 22.4 liter volume yes at stp hence we will be dividing it by 22.4 liter and now let's say that volume of gas at standard temperature and pressure is given and you are so you are supposed to calculate the number of moles what are you going to do yeah very good multiply it with 22.4 liter that's it easy peasy biryani tasty everybody yes very good Chal. All right, now we get into a little bit of stoichiometry, okay? We are getting into a little bit of stoichiometry and the first thing that we are going to talk about here is mole-mole analysis. In any given question, in any given question, this analysis is very, very, very important for quantitative analysis and let us consider this example which is 2KClO3 gives you 2KCl plus 3O2 on decomposition, okay? Let's say that. 3O2, this is what you get after decomposition. 2KClO3, you have taken 2KClO3 that decomposes. And what does it give you? It gives you 2KCl plus 3O2. All right. So that means that you can clearly see two moles of KClO3 are on decomposition is giving you two moles of KCl and it is giving you three moles of oxygen. By the way, this reaction is balanced right here, okay? And for this method, my dear students, for mole-mole analysis, you will need a balanced chemical equation. Balancing is absolutely mandatory. Do not make a mistake here. Do balance it if the equation is not balanced, all right? So now, what are you going to do? All you have to do is, all you have to do is, moles of KClO3 divided by the stoichiometric coefficient. What is the stoichiometric coefficient that I just told you about? This, my dear student, this 2, this coefficient that you see, this 2 here and this 3 here, these are called as your stoichiometric coefficient and you're just going to divide it and equate them. So, for example, moles of KClO3 divided by 2 is equal to moles of KCl divided by 2 and moles of O2 divided by 3. You get the point? Easy peasy? Great. Now, for any general balanced equation, let's say that you have a balanced equation which is AA plus BB gives you CC plus DB. What are you going to do? Moles of A reacted divided by small letter A. Small letter A is the stoichiometric coefficient. Next, small letter B is the stoichiometric coefficient. So, moles of B reacted divided by small letter B, which is the stoichiometric coefficient. And this is going to be equal to whatever is on the product side. What do you have on the product side? You have small letter C and capital letter C. That means that what are you going to write here? You are going to write here, my dear student, moles of capital C reacted divided by C. What is C? What is the small letter C? The small letter C is the stoichiometric coefficient. This is equal to moles of capital D reacted divided by small letter D. Getting my point? Yes. Okay. Now, a little more trick here. If you are given mass, if you are given mass and you have to calculate the mole, what are you going to do? You are going to, you are going to here 
divided by atomic weight or molecular weight as and what I just told you. See, number of particles are given to you. If you have to calculate mole, what are you going to do? Divided by Avogadro number, right? So you are given mass here. See, you are given mass here and you want to calculate the mole. So if mass is given to you and you have to calculate mole, then what are you going to do? Divide it by molar mass. So right here, what are we doing? Here you are going to divide it by atomic weight or molecular weight. You will get the mole. Once you get the mole, then you find out the mole-mole relationship of the equation, something like this, okay? Sort of like this. You are doing, you are going to do that. Then you are going to get the molar ratio. Now, if you get the mole, okay, if you get the moles, then after that, what are you going to do? Once you get the mole, you need to calculate either mass or you will be calculating volume at STP. So this is actually the mind map or the, or what do you say? This is the flow chart of how you are going to solve a question that is related to mole mole analysis and if it comes in your exam. All right, my dear students. Yes, great. Okay, now. Like I said, you will need here a balanced chemical equation. Now, once you get the balanced chemical equation, you will be able to calculate the volume of the gaseous reactant and you will also be able to see the mass of the reactant. Once you do that, if you get the mass of the reactant, then what are you going to do? Divide it by molar mass, you will get the moles of each reactant. If you get the volume of the gaseous reactant, what are you going to do? Divide it by 22.4 liters. You are going to get the mole of each reactant. After that, you will calculate the mole divided by coefficient for coefficient ratio for each reactant and if you see that all the ratios are same that means that that equation is stoichiometric if it is not then you are going to call it as non-stoichiometric all right yes now everybody now everybody before we get into limiting reagent there are certain other things that we have to learn and those are everybody relative and vapor density very 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 important so let's go we're going to understand now relative and vapor density, okay? Relative and vapor density. This is very important, especially vapor density. Vapor density is very important. So, first of all, everybody, can somebody tell me what is the definition of density or, or what is the formula of density? Come on, guys. Come on, come on, come on, come on. I, I'm going to wait for a minute. Going to wait for a minute, everybody. Let me know. Yes, yes. What is it? What is it? What is it? Come on. Yeah. Very good. It is density is equal to mass by volume. If you, if you tell me, if any of you tell me that ma'am, I do not know. Like this one virtual punch is coming to you, okay? And, and like this, holding this pen like this so that, you know, I poke you like this. Like, what are you doing? Study. What are you doing? Study. Anyway, so density is equal to mass by volume. Now, what is relative density? I mean, relative density is basically what Sharma ji ka beta, you have to compare, right? You have to take something in reference, okay? You have to take something in reference. So, what is our relative density, but choose my relative density or our relative density is basically density of any substance, okay? It is density of any substance, yeah, 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 divided by density of a reference sub, sub, substance okay density of density of reference substance all right everybody yes now you're going to ask me so now then what is vapor density vapor density but choose it is the ratio of the mass of a certain volume of a gas or vapor and what are you going to do? To the mass, here also this is relative, okay? This is relative. It's a ratio, right? So to the mass of the same volume of hydrogen. So that means that in this case, we are taking hydrogen as reference, all right? What are we doing? We are taking hydrogen as reference. So let me write that down, everybody. Let me write that down. What is vapor density, I ask then, right? Vapor density. Chalo, let me write this here. Vapor density my dear students yes so it is the ratio it is the ratio of the mass ratio of the mass of a certain volume of a gas of a gas okay or vapor whatever you want to write that's fine okay of a gas to the mass, to the mass of the 
same volume, same volume of hydrogen, volume of hydrogen and under similar conditions, yes, similar conditions are very important. Under similar conditions of temperature and pressure. So that means how can we write the formula for vapor density? What is going to be the formula for vapor density? The formula for vapor density can be written as, my dear students, have a look here. It, is, it can be written as mass of certain volume of vapor, mass of certain volume of a vapor divided by mass of, divided by mass of the same volume of hydrogen. Gotcha? So that means that we can write it as VD, vapor density. So th these are different formulas, everybody. The different formula here is, yes, you can also write it as molecular, molecular mass divided by 2. Okay, this is a different formula, everybody. Please note it down, all right? Yes, so that means, everybody, tell me something. So from here, if you want to calculate molecular mass, what if they are asking you, they are giving you vapor density and they are asking you to find the molecular like mass? That, that easy question won't come, but still, we should be prepared for anything and everything, isn't it? So yeah, molecular mass. So that means that molecular mass is, is equal to 2 multiplied with vapor density. Make a sense of all right, guys, everybody. Okay. Now, once this is done, everyone, now once this is done, now we are going to understand the limiting reagent. What is this limiting reagent, everybody? As you all can clearly see, let's say that we want to make burger because, yeah, this is this chapter is as simple as making a sandwich. Just like somebody told me that, ma'am, Pavel sir says that. So, yeah, I'm also using his dialogue, yeah. Anyway, guys, everybody. So, have a look, guys. Have a look. So let's say that you have reactants, you have let's say salamis or ham, anything you want to put in your burger. Then you have buns, okay, you have two pair of buns here, you have two pair of buns here, you have two pair of buns here, you have two pair of buns here. That means you have four pair of buns here and then you have one, two, three, four, five, six. You have six cheese slices and then you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven patties you have. So what do you have? You have three ham four pairs of buns, you have six sandwiches and you have seven patties, okay? But how much can you make? How many burgers can you make with all of these in pictures? So if you want if you want to put one patty, one cheese and you know, you take one pair of bun and then you take the ham, you will only be able to make what? Three pair of burgers, isn't it? If you make only three burgers, that means what are the excess reagents? What are the ones? What, which ones are the... So which ones are the substances that are not at all used here? The ones that are not used completely are the buns, it's the patty, it's the cheese. Yes, these are the ones that are not used. So that means that in, in a reaction as well, what happens is you have one substance which is at more and the other one which is at less. And this less one is the one that can actually dictate how much, what is the extent of the completion of the a reactant which is why we come across something that is called as limiting reagent and excess reagent all right so what happens in case of limiting reagent and excess reagent and when do you get it you get it in a non-stoichiometric reaction my people yes when, when do you get it you get it in a non-stoichiometric reaction obviously if both the stoichio if, if the stoichiometry is followed if the reaction is stoichiometric then that means that both of them are equivalent equivalent right then how will one one substance be more and one substance will be less it won't happen right exactly so for you to be able to uh, get a limiting reagent and an excess reagent you will need non-stoichiometric reaction then some reactants are left after the reaction which are called as excess reagent some reactants which has the lowest value of mole divided by coefficient ratio that will become your limiting reagent the most of the product formed is equal to is, 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 is equal to what stoichiometric coefficient of product multiplied with mole by coefficient ratio of limiting reagent okay then how do you calculate moles of the excess reacted excess reagent how many moles of excess reagent has reacted how will you find that out? How will you find that out? 
For that, what will you do? Stoichiometric coefficient of excess reagent multiplied with mole divided by coefficient ratio of limiting reagent. Do you get it, everybody? Have a look at this. Yes, this is what is your formula. These are all formulas, by the way. Yes. So, limiting reagent is the one that gets completely consumed in the reaction and that is the one that decides the amount of product formed. It will be decided by limiting reagent and not excess reagent, my dear student. Pay attention here. Now, let us have a look at, let us have a look at excess reactant for once. So, you have non-stoichiometric reaction. Then, then what will you do? You will find that some reactants are left after the reaction, which is your excess reagent. Reactant, which is the lowest value of mole divided by coefficient ratio is limited. I think we have just done this. Uh, this, sli this slide got uh, repeated. Okay, this uh, slide got repeated. No worries. I'm just going to delete it right away. Yeah, deleted it, everybody. Chal. Now, guys, now we get into, so that's it. That's it from your mole concept and stoichiometry, everybody. And now, my dear students, we get into the concentration of solution. But before we start with concentration of solution, we do have something else. Just a second, guys. Just a second. Let me do this cut. And then I'm going to paste it here. All right. I'm just copying it. Great. We have our pages. We have our pages. So now we're going to start with a different chapter, which is our, which is our, what is it? What is it? What is it? Everybody. Yes, yes, yes. We got, we got, we got, we got, we got our solutions chapter. Yes, we got our liquid solutions chapter everybody now in this chapter my dear students yes in this uh, chapter called as solution the very first thing that we are going to talk about is henry's law do you guys know what is henry's law you know what let me not get into henry's law first i want to talk to you about concentration of solution now in case of a solution it becomes very important that you are talking about the concentration why because in our younger days we learned about diluted and concentrated and in science is very vague who cares what is diluted and what is concentrated because whenever you're talking about dilution and concentration remember i gave you this example that i told you the sharma ji ka beta are baba if you guys are the toppers, then do you really think that Sharma Ji Ka Beta is also going to be a topper? No, it is a, it is in a reference, right? So dilute and concentrated, first of all, it's very vague term. And in science, we do not talk about vague terms, right? In science, we always want to precisely do something, which is why we even have mathematical derivations that, that relates it to integration and differentiation. So if we understand that, that means we will understand that why it was it so important for us to express this concentration terms of solution. So there are several concentration terms. Some that depend on weight and weight. Some that depend on weight and volume. Now weight and weight are those normality, molality terms. And weight by volume terms, those are temperature dependent. And there are sometimes we don't want to use them. Why so? Because the volume changes with temperature and if volume changes with temperature, that means our molarity is also going to change. That means our normality is also going to change. And like I said, calculations have to be perfect. Otherwise, science is not science anymore. Chemistry is not chemistry anymore. So calculations, to make calculations perfect, we needed to use percentage weight by weight more because it has less amount of temperature dependency or we can say that it, it does not have any temperature dependency whatsoever. So now guys, sabse pehle, first of all, let us talk about percentage weight by weight. The first one here. What, how do you define it? You define it as mass of solute, mass of solute in grams present in 100 grams of solution. What is the formula? The formula everybody is percentage weight by weight is equal to mass of solute divided by mass of solution multiplied with 100. Getting my point? Yes. Next one. Percentage weight by volume, yes. Mass of solute in grams present in 100 milliliter of solution. That means that the formula here will become percentage weight by volume is equal to mass of solute divided by volume of solution multiplied with 100. Why are we multiplying with 100? Come on, look at the term, percentage, everybody. <laughs> yeah, it would be stupidity if we do not multiply it with 100. Anyway, 
Now we are going to talk about percentage volume by volume and here we see that volume of solute present in 100 milliliter of solution. That means that percentage volume by volume is equal to volume of solute divided by volume of solution multiplied with 100. Gotcha? Yes, clear? Very simple, very easy formulas. Don't even have to look at it so much because these are the most easy formulas. These are like, you know, 9th or 10th standard formulas, isn't it? Yes. Okay, moving on guys. Now, let us have a look at mole fraction. So, what is mole fraction? Mole fraction is basically your ratio of number of moles of a particular component to the total number of moles of the solution. That means that chi of A, chi of A, this represents chi. Chi is the mole fraction. You represent mole fraction with this, uh, you know, Greek letter called as chi. Now, what is A? So, in a solution, we usually have two components. One, one part is solute and the other part is your solute, other part is your solvent. Generally, solvent is in larger amount, solute is in smaller amount, right? So, in this case, when we are writing A component, that means we are either talking about the solvent component or we are talking about the solution or, or we are talking about the solute component. And once again, everybody, generally, most of the time, adhiktar vakt, what do we see? We see that the solvent is the component A and the solute is the component B. So in this case, maybe we are talking about solvent. However, since it is in general, doesn't matter, no conclusions, just know this, okay? So you will write it as chi of A is equal to N of A. N of A is a number of moles of the component that is present divided by total number of total number of moles, okay? That means Na plus Nb plus Nc. Now, one thing that you have to remember here is, or you do remember everybody, that is that the sum of all the mole fractions of all the components in the mixture, it has to be equal to 1, okay? All right, guys. Coming this side, we can see that now we have to also study about parts per million. What is parts per million? This is the number of parts of solute that is present in every 1 million parts of the solution. So, parts per million is equal to number of parts of the component divided by total number of parts of all components of the solution multiplied with 10 to the power 6. Why 10 to the power 6? This is very uh, equal to, uh, you know, this is absolutely as same as your percentage weight by weight. All you have to do is, you know, instead of 100, you write it as 10 to the power 6. That's it. Now, in case of percentage, what happens? The concentration in parts per million can also be expressed as mass to mass, volume to volume or mass to volume. Getting it? Getting it everybody? Easy peasy? Nothing too hard yet? Nothing too hard, isn't it? Now guys, we come across something that is molarity and molality. And these are the two terms that we are going to talk about a lot. <laughs> or we talk about it a lot and in every examination paper we get to see these terms, right? Anyway, so what is molarity, everybody? Molarity is number of moles of solute that is present in one liter of solution. So molarity capital M is equal to moles of solute divided by volume of solution liter. Molarity, like I told you already, it is temperature dependent quantity. Now when we come across molality, we see that molality is denoted with small letter M, everybody. And it is moles of solute divided by mass of solvent in kg. So molality is a temperature independent quantity quantity okay all right and here is all the convert all the conversion of concentration terms that i am also going to write it down for you so don't worry about it i will be writing it down absolutely not to worry you have nothing to worry all right yes now my dear students let us come across henry's law okay let us come across henry's law what did our dearest Henry Bhaiya or Henry Anna say? Henry Cheta said that the most commonly used form of Henry's law states that the partial pressure P of the gas in vapor phase is proportional to the mole fraction of the gas in the solution and it is expressed as, as you will see, we will write it down. So what did Henry Cheta said? He said that the partial pressure the partial pressure P of the gas, okay? The partial pressure P of the gas, yes, in, in vapor phase, in vapor phase is proportional, is proportional to the mole fraction 
to the mole fraction chi of the gas okay to the mole fraction chi of the gas in the solution and it is expressed as and it is expressed as p is equal to k h dot chi okay this is how you write it now once henry's uh, law is done now we also come across something that is called as raoul's law everybody what is this raoul's law now raoul's law everyone is you know what i taught you this chapter very 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 recently so i'm pretty sure that you all remember it what is raoul's law everyone raoul's law is for ideal solution what do we talk about we are talking about ideal solution okay so let me write that down once again for ideal solution for ideal solution what do we write the partial vapor pressure is directly proportional to the partial vapor pressure the partial vapor pressure is directly proportional to is directly proportional to their mole fraction to their mole fraction at what was the definition guys i keep forgetting this it's very we ought to learn definitions at this age at constant temperature for two components a and b in a uh, liquid solution I, i think that's what it is please please can you just correlate and uh, tell me temperature for now now okay that's it for two components okay for two components a and b in liquid solution a and b in liquid solution what do we know how do we write it as how do we write it as anybody i'm pretty sure that you all know it is pa is proportional to chi a now to remove this proportionally constant what will we do we will write it as pa is equal to pa not chi a isn't it yes and similarly we will write it for pb is directly proportional to chi b that means pb is equal to pb not chi b isn't it now my dear students you tell me what is going to be the total pressure the total pressure that means pt yes total pressure pt is equal to pa plus pb right that means that we can also write it as pa not chi a plus pa not sorry p b not chi b and i'm not going to do the rest of the derivation which i think you should know right and you all know that chi a and chi b are the mole fraction in liquid phase and p not is the partial pressure of pure compounds right yes that's it okay now after raoul's law we do come across something that is called as ideal and non ideal but we will read about that in some time let us talk about dalton's law first okay let us quickly go through all the laws here now we come across dalton's law everybody what is dalton's law dalton's law is usually used in the partial pressure of gas yes he spoke about partial pressure of gas so everybody what is it what does it say it says that partial pressure of gas of gas is equal to mole fraction it's equal to mole fraction multiplied with total pressure of gas yes multiplied with total pressure of gas everybody so that means that you know we, we can write it as pa is equal to now what he did was what he did was remember in da, in, in raoul's law just now we studied that it was P A not chi A. Right here, this guy, what he did was he not only took the mole fraction in liquid phase, but he spoke about the mole fraction in the vapor phase. So instead of writing it as chi A, he wrote it as y A. If you remember, so P A is equal to y A multiplied with P T. P T is what total pressure, right? Similarly, for component B, you can write P B is equal to y B multiplied with total pressure right that means that pa plus pb is equal to pt everybody right now what is this ya and yb what is this ya and yb i just told you that ya and yb are mole fraction in vapor phase what is it mole fraction in vapor phase everybody right 
Now, what is Chi A and Chi B, everyone? What is Chi A and Chi B? Again, I have just told you that as well. It is mole fraction in liquid phase, people. What is it? It is mole fraction in liquid phase, please. Yes, everybody? Got it, uh, got it, it seems. My God. While teaching chemistry, I've forgotten my English. That cannot happen. No, oh my God. That cannot happen. Anyway. All right, guys. So, this is clear, everybody? Is this clear? Great. Okay. Now we come across something that is called as ideal and non-ideal solution. And uh, I know that th this, this whole picture, it will come to you in the form of PDF. Don't worry about it. And I will also give you all the formulas. Okay. I will also write down all the formulas so that you have it at the fingertips. Don't worry about it. Just go through before your exam. Just go through the slides and I promise you will rock it everybody. Now. Let us come across something that is called as ideal and non-ideal solution. So just now we have studied Raoult's law and there are those solutions that do not follow Raoult's law. So they are called as, you know, so whoever follows ideal, uh, whoever follows it, they are the ones that are going to be Raoult's law. That means those solutions that obey Raoult's law, they are called as ideal solution. Yes. And they have to follow it in the entire range of concentration, by the way. Yes. And whoever does not follow it, we call them as non-ideal solutions. So the solution that do not obey Raoult's law over the entire range of concentration, they are called as non-ideal. In non-ideal, then you have positive deviation and negative devi deviation that we will come across in some time. But now, let us talk about ideal solutions. So what happens in an ideal, ideal solution is, let's say that you have component A and you have component B. Now the A-B interaction in the solution are as equal as the AA interaction and the BB interaction. For example, let us try to understand this in a better way, okay? Let's say that I have taken two glue pens like this, okay? Let's say that I've taken two glue pen here and let us say that I have uh, taken, okay? I'm gonna take two pilot pen, okay? I'm gonna take two pilot pen, okay? So see, I'm gonna take two pilot pen here and I'm gonna take two blue pen here. So let us understand that when these two react, let's call this blue pen, this gel pens, let's call them A and let's call them B. So we are saying that when these two will come together, the interaction between the A and B, the interaction between A and B is equal to the interaction between BB and AA. Do you understand? These two, the interaction between this AA and the interaction between ooh, BB, it is equal when they come together as well so this will be your ideal solution which in nature we obviously do not get it right however yes there are examples there are examples such as n-hexane and n-heptane benzene and toluene because the structures are also very similar there are you know the properties are slightly similar okay all right now but this something something that is very important right here my dear student is that delta h mix is, is equal to zero delta v mix is, is equal to zero that means there is no difference when you mix them in the volume. There is no difference in the heat absorbed or heat released. Okay. All right, everybody. Now, coming to here, coming to this side, that is the non-ideal solution. We see here that the forces of attraction between AA and BB will be different from AB here. Yes. Now, this time it is going to be different. Now, it can either be more or it can be less. And from there, we will understand the positive and negative deviation. But hold on, hold on to thought. Here, the delta H mix is not equal to zero. Neither is the delta V mix equal to zero. Solution of water and ethanol. Solution of water and ethanol. When you mix water and alcohol, it's a non-ideal solution. It's not an ideal solution, right? Now, we come across something that is called as positive deviation and negative deviation. So, partial pressure of each component A and B, when it is higher than that, calculated from Raoult's law, then it will be positive deviation. That means the P total that you have calculated is less. But the, you know, the P total that you have calculated from Raoult's law is, is higher. Sorry, it's, it's lower. And the partial pressure of each of the components that is higher. So that time you get a positive deviation. So when and another factor everybody is boiling point of A is lower than boiling points of both A and B. When you mix them together, whatever boiling point you get, it is actually higher than the boiling point, than the boiling point of the component, than the boiling point of that component itself. Am I saying it right? Once again, let's get it. 
boiling point is lower than boiling points of both A and B. Okay, so after mixing it, whatever boiling point you get, that is lower than the boiling points of the component A and component B. Are you getting it? Okay, all right. Now, please have a look at the graph. I have taught you the graph long, long back. I'm not going to get into it because that's not a formula and we are doing formula revision right now. Now, coming to negative deviation, we say that the partial pressure of each component A and B, it is lower than the one that is calculated from Raoult's law. So, you must have calculated something from Raoult's law. But the calculated version is higher than the ones that you already have. Okay, than the ones that you already have. So, here boiling point is higher than boiling points of both. A and B. All right. Yes. Same. Same. Just ulta ulta. Okay. Now, guys, what what else do we see? Th these are the factors that are very important. So, for positive deviation, delta H mix is greater than zero. Delta V mix is greater than zero. Delta S mix is greater than zero. And delta G mix is lesser than zero. Please remember these. Please remember this. Okay. Yes. What are the examples? Chloroform, uh, chloroform and water. Ethanol and CCL4. Methanol and chloroform. Benzene and Ethanol, these examples are there in your NCRT. Have a look at it, okay? Now, let us come across negative deviation. Here, what do we have? Delta H mix is lesser than 0. Delta V mix is lesser than 0. Delta S mix is greater than 0. Delta G mix is lesser than 0. So, that means these two are similar, similar for both positive and negative deviation. However, examples are chloroform and methyl acetyl, H2O and hydrochloric acid, water and nitric acid, acetic acid and pyridine, phenol and aniline. All right. Yes. Now, my dear students, coming to the end of the solution chapter, what do you have? You have colligative properties. You have four different types of colligative properties. These are relative lowering and vapor pressure, which is also known as RLVP. And the formula to create a formula to calculate it is PA0 minus PA divided by PA0 is equal to NB divided by total number of moles that means Na plus Nb all right now how do you calculate elevation in boiling point delta Tb is equal to Kbm your, your Kb is ebullioscopic constant depression in freezing point is calculated as delta Tf is equal to Kfm Kf is called as cryoscopic constant then you have osmotic pressure which you denoted as pi is equal to capital CRT now everybody let us introduce something that is called as the Van Hoff factor everybody ready Yes, what is this Van Hoff factor? That means it is I. I is what? Let us calculate everybody. Now, this is called as your abnormal molar mass. Okay, we are going to talk about abnormal molar mass and Van Hoff factor. Okay, and Van Hoff factor, which is denoted as nothing but I. So, what is this I, my bachus? This I, everybody, is your experimental values of colligative properties, okay? Experimental. Experimental values of colligative properties, okay? Of colligative property. Divided by what? Calculated. Simple, simple, yes. Divided by calculated values of colligative property all right yes everybody that means we can also say that experimental divided by calculated right so that means we can also say that it can be observed values okay observed value of colligative property observed value of colligative property divided by what do i write normal value okay divided by Normal value of colligative property. Am I right, everybody? Yes. Now, this can also be equal to, my dear students, this can be equal to normal molecular mass divided by observed calc observed molecular mass. Or, or instead of normal, let us write calculated. Okay. Let us write here. Calculated molecular mass, everybody. Let us write here. Calculated molecular mass divided by observed, observed molecular mass. That means that it is equal to M calculated divided by M observed. In a shorter form, we can write this. Okay. 
all right everybody yes do we understand this do we understand this do we understand this we do right yes now we finally come across something that is called as association and dissociation that means that when you dissolve something what happens is sometimes for example hydrochloric acid when you dissolve hydrochloric acid or when you dissolve sodium chloride what happens they dissociate sodium chloride that was nacl initially at the moment you have dissolved it in water it becomes na plus cl minus so for dissociation we have to calculate the van Hoff factor i which is nothing but wow which is nothing but it has it has gone somewhere it is one plus my god dude my god it shouldn't have been like this isn't it my god one second guys one second i'll tell you right away <laughs> i'll tell you right away one second everybody yes it is one plus n alpha minus alpha everyone okay minus alpha this is your dissociation this is the formula for dissociation and the van Hoff factor i for association that means what happens is when you put acetic acid in benzene the dimerizes it associate it clutters it clumps right so that is called as association so when association happens your formula for i is one minus alpha multiplied no one minus alpha plus one minus alpha plus alpha divided by n okay alpha divided by n all right you know what let me write this better let me write this better one minus alpha plus alpha divided by n this is for your i association and your dissociation everybody is one plus n alpha minus alpha right this is your formula this is your formula and what is alpha alpha my dear students is your degree of association or degree of dissociation clear all right now before we move on to electrochemistry as i told you i will be giving you some conversion formulas okay i will be giving you some formulas that are really really important for your conversions everybody so let's have a look at it Chal, here we have three pages and now we're going to write them one by one okay so one second All right, number one, everybody, is mole fraction of solute into molarity of solution. So if you are given mole fraction of solute and you have to calculate it in molarity, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? I'm going to help you. Don't worry about it. You don't have to do anything. You just have to sit here and listen and we will solve it, everybody. So mole fraction, mole fraction of solute, yes, into molarity of solution the formula everybody is going to be have a look here i will tell you all the terms i will define all the terms later but now i'm just quickly going to write it down first okay quickly i'm going to write it down first so you will write it as chi 2 rho chi 2 rho multiplied with thousand divided by divided by chi 1 m1 plus m2 chi2 okay we will come to what are the explanations of all the term later on at one go i will tell you all about it don't worry about it next everybody is molarity into mole fraction okay next is molarity into mole fraction my dear students that we can calculate it as okay that we can calculate it as how do we do this molarity into mole fraction that means okay all right yes it was chi2 is equal to m m1 multiplied with 1000 divided by rho multiplied with 1000 minus m m2 okay make sense everyone nonsense don't, don't worry even if it does not make sense don't worry i will tell you all all the this thing all the important terms just listen to it and make a note of it right now now mole fraction mole fraction into molality okay mole fraction into into molality everyone is let's say small m right small m small letter m is equal to chi 2 multiplied with 1000 divided by chi 1 multiplied with m 1 all right now next everybody is the fourth one everyone is 
molality into mole fraction. Molality into mole fraction everyone. Molality into mole fraction, how do you write it? You will write it as chi 2 is equal to small letter m multiplied with m1 divided by 1000 plus molality 1. Okay, divided by 1000 plus molality 1. Now, next word, what is it going to be? Molality into molarity. Let us do that. Yes, let us do that. Molality into molarity. What did I say? Molality, right? Huh. Molality into molarity. Molality into molarity. That means that capital M is equal to small letter M multiplied with rho multiplied with 1000 divided by 1000 plus M capital M2. All right. Yes. Number six, everybody. Number six for you is molarity into molarity. Obviously, I think you should have guessed it. Molarity into molality. Did you guys watch? Uh, have you guys watched the Benedict Cumberbatch? What is his name? Sherlock Holmes. Have you watched it? If you have, then do you know the do you know the villain of Sherlock Holmes? The arch nemesis of Sherlock Holmes. Who is it? His name also is sort of like molarity, uh, molality, and all of that. Do you know? If you don't know or if you know, write it down in the comment section. I want to know if you guys watch any interesting shows or not. <laughs> but not right now. Do not watch it now. Okay. 1000 multiplied with rho minus M2. Now, all the questions that you are probably asking that ma'am, what is M1 ma'am? What is M2 ma'am? Ma'am, what is rho ma'am? Chalo. Now, I am going to tell you everybody. Put a star mark here and write it down. First of all, what is M1 and M2? Your capital M1 and M2, obviously, my dear students, are molar masses. Okay, they are molar masses of solvent and solute. Of solvent and solute. Solute seems like solute. No, delulu. <laughs> Anyway, rho here is density. All right. Yes. Density of what? Density of solution. But choose density of solution. Yes. All right. Next is your capital M. Your capital M obviously is molarity. Was there? A, a, what were you thinking? You were thinking something else? No. Okay. Small letter M is equal to molality. Yep. And what is chi 1? Chi 1 is mole fraction. Chi 1 is mole fraction of, let's say, solvent. And what is chi 2? Chi 2 is mole fraction of solute. Solute. Yes. And done. That's it. The solution chapter, my dear students, are, is, is, is over for you. Absolutely over for you. So with this note, now we are going to start with electrochemistry. Are you ready? Let us go ahead guys. So electrochemistry, what are the first things first in electrochemistry? Electrochemistry, the first thing that we are going to read about is electrode potential. Okay. We are going to read about electrode potential, but just give me a moment, everybody. Just give me a moment, everyone. I'm gonna drink a little bit of water and then I'm gonna start. Okay, all right, everybody, chill. All right, so the first things first, everybody, in this chapter is going to be your electrode potential. You got a break, isn't it? You got a break for two minutes, I know. Anyway, guys, electrode potential. Chalo, let us talk about it. All right, so electrode potential for any electrode, okay? For any, my God, my handwriting is... Worst case scenario. <laughs> anyway, for any electrode, 
What is it? It is oxidation potential. It is oxidation potential, which is equal to, which is equal to, my dear student, please pay attention here. Look what I'm writing. I'm writing minus reduction potential. Okay. It is minus reduction potential. Cool. All right. So that means now if I want to write E cell is equal to my E cell formula will be RP of cathode. RP of cathode minus RP of anode. All right. Yes, that means reduction potential of cathode minus reduction potential of anode. And similarly, I can also write it as E cell is also equal to RP of cathode everybody yes it can be equal to rp of cathode plus oxidation potential of anode all right all right oxidation potential of anode now if i want to write down e naught cell okay e naught cell is the standard e cell so that means here what am i going to introduce i'm going to introduce the term standard here so standard rp of cathode standard rp of cathode minus standard reduction potential minus standard reduction potential of anode everybody now what if we increase the standard reduction potential of value or what if we see there is an increased uh, you know value of standard reduction potential so what will happen what will happen any idea Yes, very good. You have to understand that greater the standard reduction potential value, greater is the oxidizing power, everyone. Okay, greater is the oxidizing power. Now, we quickly, quickly, quickly. <laughs> Sorry, guys, something is wrong with me, definitely. Maybe I am too excited for your uh, exam. Yeah, it could be anything. I don't know what it is, but yeah, some something must be off. Anyway. Now, guys, let us quickly go to Gibbs free energy. Yes, Gibbs free energy. Gibbs free energy change. So, Gibbs free energy, how do you write it? You write it as delta G is equal to minus NF E cell. What is, uh, what is F? F is Faraday's constant. So we can also write it as delta G naught is equal to minus N F E naught cell. All right. We can make it standardized. Okay. Now when we come to nonst equation, everybody, nonst equation, I'm pretty sure that most of you know, I should not even be writing this, but any which way your benefit is my benefit. So writing it down here. What is nonst equation, guys? Nonst equation is basically the effect of concentration and temperature on any EMF of cell all right or of an emf of cell what is emf electromotive force right so writing this down here as well it is the effect of concentration it is the effect of concentration and temperature okay temperature of an emf of cell am i right everybody yes do you understand? Now, you must have seen the formula for Nernst equation. Most of you must have seen it as, you know, E cell is equal to E naught cell minus 2.303 RT divided by NF log. Yes, NF log product here C to the power C capital D to the power D divided by capital A to the power A and capital B to the power B, right? This is what you must have seen. And this whole term, my dear students, it can be written as Q. What is Q? Q is the reaction quotient. What is Q? Q is the reaction quotient, my dear student. Yes, what is it? Reaction quotient. Do you understand this, everybody? Do you understand this, guys? Yes? Just a second. I need more pages. Where was I writing? This is where, right? Just a second, guys. Okay. All right. Yes. Hmm. All right. So now let me just derive it a little bit for you so that you have it at your fingertips once again. Yeah. So we can write it as delta G is equal to delta G naught, yes, plus RT ln of Q. 
What is Q? As I just told you, it is reaction quotient. Okay. Q is basically this whole term. This can be written as Q. Okay. All right, everybody. Moving on from here. Now, see, I have not used the term 2.303, which I'm pretty sure that you all know that when you convert natural log to log, only then you have to use the 2.303 RT term. Okay. Yes, everybody. Now, guys, moving on here, I can write it as E cell is equal to E naught cell minus RT divided by NF ln of Q, right? Yes. Which I can write it as E cell is equal to E naught cell minus 2.303 RT divided by NF. Yes, log Q. Can I not write it? I can write it like this. And sometimes you must have seen that all of these terms, since they are all, since they are all constant, right? 2.303 RT and F, these are all constant. So if you calculate the value for all of these, then what do you get? You get it as E cell is equal to E naught cell minus 0 0.0591 divided by N multiplied with log of Q. Do you get it, everyone? Yes. Now, by chance, if you have to calculate it at equilibrium, at chemical equilibrium, then what will happen? If you have to calculate it at chemical equilibrium, my dear students, yes. At chemical equilibrium, you all know that delta G is equal to zero, which means that E cell is equal to zero. So we can write it as log of KEQ is equal to N E naught cell. Yes, N E naught cell divided by 0 0.059. 0 0.591. Okay. That means from this particular equation, I can find out that E naught cell is going to be equal to 0 0.0591 divided by N multiplied with log of KEQ. What is KEQ? Equilibrium constant. That's it. Yes, equilibrium constant, everybody. That's it. So this is your, this was, my dear students, your nonce equation, which I'm pretty sure that you all know. Correct, everybody? Yes, great. Now, let us talk about the calculation of different thermodynamics, uh, different thermodynamics function of cell reaction. Okay. All right. But before that, let me just quickly check. Are those written here? Are those written here? No, we have specific conductance and all of that. Chalo, okay. All right, yes. Let us have a look at, my dear student, okay, again, this is very, very, very important. Yes, this is very, very, very important. And you may get a question from here. So, please pay attention, okay? Yes, what are we doing? We are doing calculation of, calculation of different thermodynamics function of cell reaction. Okay, so first of all, as we know that delta G is equal to minus NF E cell, right? Yes, everybody, we all know this. So let me write that down here. Let me write that down. I will write it as delta G is equal to minus N F E cell. Okay. Now from here, S is, is equal to minus D capital G divided by DT at constant pressure. At constant pressure, if I'm calculating, then what will I get? I will get delta S is equal to minus D delta G divided by DT here. And here I will write again constant pressure. Yes, at constant pressure we are calculating. That means that I can write it as NF D by DT here. Yes, E cell, E cell once again at constant pressure. Right? Right everybody? Because what is delta G? Delta G is what? Minus NF E cell. Now N and F are both constant. So E cell, right? That's, that's the whole point of differentiation, isn't it? Differentiation as well as integration. Constants cannot be differentiated or integrated. You know that. So N and F both are, you know, constant. So we are going to take that all out and only E cell at constant pressure. That is what we are going to do, okay? Now, let's say that we want to calculate it for delta H, okay? So for delta H, we are going to calculate it as everybody, yes? It will be NF 
एन एफ टी डो ई डिवाइडेड बाय डो टी यस एट कांस्टेंट प्रेशर माइनस ई सॉरी द ब्रैकेट इज रॉन्ग माइनस ई ओके नाउ व्हाट इज गोइंग टू बी डेल्टा सीपी व्हाट इज गोइंग टू बी डेल्टा सीपी ऑफ सेल रिएक्शन what is going to be delta cp of cell reaction you can give it as cp is equal to dh divided by dt that means that delta cp is equal to d divided by dt ddt of delta h of course right so that means that delta cp can be written as nft d square e cell divided by dt square can i not write it like this yes i can and now my dear students we come across something that is everybody knows faraday's law of electrolysis yes we come across faraday's law what is your faraday's law everyone your faraday's first law is first law of faraday everyone is w is equal to q multiplied with z which i can also write it as z z multiplied with i multiplied with t where z is what z is your electrochemical equivalent of a substance what is it electrochemical equivalent of a substance now the amount of substance so let's say that you if you have a cell here right or let's say that you have taken a copper rod what will happen what will happen the and you have let's say that you have copper solutions so the copper is in cu2 plus state and from there it will try to take in some electrons and it will get deposited on the road so the amount of substance that is deposited or liberated at any electrode it is directly proportional to the amount of current that is passing through or the amount of charge that is passing through the solution everybody okay all right so from here we can also write it as w is equal to eq what is eq and what is qq is your q whatever i have told you already right so you can write it as w is equal to capital e multiplied with i multiplied with t can we not write that yes we can divided by if we do 96500 which is your faraday's constant you can calculate it with this also and what is e my dear student your e is equivalent weight everybody and how do you calculate equivalent weight you calculate it as molecular weight divided by n factor okay and this you learn it in the redox reactions chapter okay guys everybody now moving on what is the second law of thermodynamics okay what is the second law of thermodynamics once again i need to copy something here how come yeah i get so many pages still it gets over anyway now we're going to talk about the second law everybody and the second law suggests that my dear students it is w that is directly proportional to capital e that means that we can write it as w divided by e is equal to a constant that means that i can also write it as w1 divided by e1 is equal to w2 divided by e2 is equal to and it can go on and on if there are as many let's say there is w3 wn divided by en i can write it like this now you are going to ask me that what is this w by e this w by e my dear student is i multiplied with t multiplied with current efficiency factor what is it we will talk about it right now yes multiplied with current efficiency factor divided by divided by 96500 okay 96500 96500 that is your that is the formula now we have just introduced here a new term that is current efficiency so what do you think is your current efficiency current efficiency is the actual mass deposited or the actual mass that is produced divided by theoretical mass deposited or produced and multiplied with by 100 that's it yes so writing it down here everyone current efficiency current efficiency here is actual mass actual mass deposited yes or produced divided by th 
theoretical mass deposited or produced yes multiplied with 100 okay all right then now something that is very important is Debye Huckel on Sager equation. What does it do? It gives you a relationship between the molar, molar conductivity at a particular concentration and molar conductivity at infinite solution. That's it. That's it. So how can we write this? How can we write this? How can we write D by Huckel? Okay. D by Huckel on Sager equation. How do you write this? You write it as, my dear students, lambda m is equal to lambda m naught minus a capital root over c. And what did I say once again? Yes, let me write that also. That it gives, it gives a relation, it gives a relation between molar conductivity between molar conductivity which is lambda m at a particular concentration and molar conductivity that is lambda m at infinite dilution all right at infinite dilution okay now what is a a is a constant and what does it depend on it, de it depends upon the nature of the solvent the temperature and the type of electrolyte that you are going to use okay so that is the meaning of capital a all right here capital a means that now my dear students something that we definitely read is Colrash law okay Please do go through the, uh, you know, please do go, go through the graphs that are present for Colrash law because it's very, very, very important. So what is Colrash law? What does it say? It says that at infinite dilution, the molar conductivity of an electrolyte is, what is it? When you add the ionic conductivities of the cations and anions, that is what it is going to be. That means that if NaCl gives you Na plus and Cl minus, and if you calculate the ionic conductivities, then it is going to be the then it is going to be the molar conductivity of NaCl. Yeah, getting it? All right. So that means that Colrash law, what does it say? At infinite dilution, at infinite dilution, the molar conductivity of an electrolyte of an electrolyte is the sum of the, I have forgotten, is the sum of the ionic conductivities. Ionic conductivities of the, what did I say? Ionic conductivities of the cations and anions, yes? So, for example, let's say that we have a compound which is in the form of AXBY, right? So, that means that lambda M naught of AXBY is going to be equal to, yes, X, X. Then what do we write it as? What do we write it as? Mm, yeah, you write it as lambda A naught plus Y lambda A. Lambda B naught. And here this will be minus. Let's say this will be A plus. All right, everybody. Yes. Now, what if, what if everyone, let's say that lambda M naught at equilibrium. How will we write it? At that point of time, we will write it as A plus naught, lambda A naught plus lambda B minus naught. That's it. That's it. These are the limiting molar conductivities of the cation and the anion respectively. So whatever lambda A naught and lambda B naught that we have written, these are the limiting molar conductivity. Now, where do you apply Colrash law? You can apply Colrash law if you want to calculate degree of dissociation of weak electrolyte. And how do you do that? 
Yes, how do you do that? You do that with a formula that is alpha is equal to lambda m at concentration C divided by lambda m at infinity solution, okay, at inf infinite dilution. All right, and you all know, everyone, let me write it down here. Let me write it down here that you all know KEQ is equal to C alpha square divided by 1 minus alpha. Okay. All right. Yes, everybody. You can also use it, by the way, to calculate solubility of sparingly soluble salt and their KSP. And we know that KSP is equal to S square. Or we can write here, we can write here, or we can write here, lambda m naught is equal to kappa multiplied with 1000 divided by solubility, divided by solubility. And in here, you will take solubility's unit as mole per liter, everybody. How will you take it? You will take it as mole per liter. Now, we are going to see the small, 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 you know, relations that we have. First of all, what do you have here? You have conductance. Conductance is given as capital C or ohm to the power minus 1 or you will write it as capital S here, okay? Then you have specific conductance which is your K or ohm to the power minus 1 centimeter to the power minus 1. That is your unit here. Molar conductance is del lambda M which is the unit is lambda, uh, ohm to the power minus 1 centimeter square mole to the power minus 1. Equivalent conductance everybody is right here which is Lambda EQ and you can see the unit which is ohm to the power minus 1 centimeter square EQ to the power minus 1. Okay. Then comes specific conductance. What is specific conductance everybody? Specific conductance is the conductance of volume within the electrode. Okay. Charge with con uh, concentration. It decreases with decrease in. I'm so sorry that this happens every time when I make the slides in Google slide and then when I, you know, download it in the notability, there is some glitch that occurs and this happens to me all the time here, okay? So, it decreases with decrease in, can I just write it here? It decreases with decrease in concentration, my dear students, okay? All right, this also here decreases with decrease in concentration and increases with decrease in concentration, okay? All right, everybody. So this is also there. This is your cheat sheet. This is your formula sheet. Just write it down and know that this is how you calculate this. Okay. All right. And one more formula that is not written here that I need you all to write it down in the comment section because I know that you know it. And that is what is the formula for resistance. You know, here you have conductance. So tell me what is specific resistivity? What is resistivity? What is specific re resistance? Do write it down in the comment section and I want to know from you. Now, let us quickly move on towards chemical kinetics. Shall we? Yes, chemical kinetics. Once again, not a very tough chapter. Uh, and, and I think we will be able to solve it in a very, very, very short time, everybody. Okay. So, in this chemical kinetic chapter, the first thing that we have to read about is the rate or the velocity of a chemical reaction, okay? We're going to read about the rate or velocity of a chemical reaction. Rate or velocity of a chemical reaction. And how do you calculate it? You calculate it as my dear students, rate is equal to delta C divided by delta T. And delta C, what is going to be the, uh, you know, unit? The unit is going to be mole per liter here, mole per liter divided by time, obviously. So, seconds, that means that you can write the unit as mole per liter, yes, and time to the power minus one. That means that it can be mole dm to the power minus 3 second to the power minus 1 isn't it yes second to the power minus 1 that is what it is going to be now obviously there are different types of rates of chemical reaction okay there is average rate there is instantaneous rate so let's go and let us find it out okay let us find it out everybody so first things first let us uh, write about average rate okay so let's say that we have a reaction which goes from reactants to products and the average rate for this reaction is going to be everybody. The average rate here is going to be total change. Okay. It's going to be total change in concentration. Total change in concentration divided by total time taken. Okay. Divided by total time 
taken. Now, what is the instantaneous rate? Okay, rate instantaneous. Instantaneous. I hope I'm right about the instantaneous spelling though. This is equal to limit where t tends to 0. Okay, and we will write here delta c divided by delta t. Yes, that means that we can also write it as dc divided by dt. Yes, that means that we can also write it as my dear students minus D capital R divided by DT, which is nothing but D capital P divided by DT. And why did I write minus sign before reactant? Because reactants get consumed in a chemical reaction. That means that slowly and steadily what happens is the reactants gets reduced in a chemical reaction. All right, everybody. Now, if you have a general term, let's say, one second, guys, need a... Again, need a empty page. Life is hard, you know. Just a second, people. Just a second. All right, I have added a few pages. Okay. All right. Now, for a general reaction, okay, let's say that for, for A capital A plus B capital B gives you C capital C plus D capital D, okay? If you have a reaction like this, then what is going to happen? Then you are going to take the rate of reaction okay you are going to take the rate of reaction is equal to minus 1 divided by a and you are going to take d capital a divided by dt yes is equal to minus 1 by small letter b that means d capital b divided by dt which is equal to 1 divided by c d capital c divided by dt is equal to 1 divided by d d capital d divided by dt once again everybody as you see on the product side we have kept kept it as positive whereas on the reactant side we have kept it as negative right now we come across something that is called as the rate law everyone yes what do we come across we come across something that is called as the rate law what is this rate law everybody what is this rate law for a chemical reaction yes for a chemical reaction let's say that a, A and B, B, they form a product. So the rate is going to be, you know what, let's write it. Let's write it. Instead of me telling you this, I think if I write it, then it will be easier for you to understand. So for a chemical reaction, do you see how fast we are running? Yes. If we run this fast, I think that we will probably be the only channel where we have covered so many formulas about a little more than 100 formulas in about just two two and a half hours or so okay so we will see if we can complete it yes all the other people they have taken many 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 uh, you know much time to cover it but we are going to complete it in a very short time sure so for a chemical reaction let's say that you have a a plus you have b b what are you going to get you are going to get some product right you are definitely going to get some product. So now that means that I can write the rate is that the rate is directly proportional to let's say a b to the power beta. Now if I want to remove this proportionality sign then what do I have to do? I will have to use here k and then I will write it as a to the power alpha and capital B to the power beta. Here A and B are what? The A and the B, they are the molar concentrations, okay? So A and B are molar concentrations. But choose, yes, these are molar concentrations. Understanding everybody? Yes. Can I get some hashtag APBT if you are understanding? Please let me know. Are you guys writing it down or not? What are you guys saying? Okay. All right. I really hope you are understanding. Please write down EPBT, EPBT, EPBT. I am saying EPBT so many times. I think I am a little hungry. So shall we finish the class soon? Come on guys. Come on. With me, with me, with me. Everybody. Yes. And what is K? 
Yes, so these are the molar concentration of your A and B respectively. And what is the K, my dear students? The K is the, what is, going, what is it going to be? Velocity. Yes, it is the velocity constant or, or, or we can also call it as something very simple, very easy. That is your rate constant, my dear students. And yes, that is absolutely right. Okay, that is absolutely right. Now, let us have a look at the different order of reactions, okay? Different order of reactions, everybody. And this is very important. We're going to draw a table and we're going to write it down, okay? So, we have different order reaction, right? Yes, okay? So, first of all, I'm going to write here order, yes? And make a table like this. So you will have zero order. You have first order. And you have second order reactions. Right. Then here we are going to write here. Rate law equation. How does the rate law equation look like? Then here we are going to write down the rate constant my dear students. And finally at the end right here we will write down the half life period. That means at what time the concentration of the reactants will be half. So, rate law equation, rate constant and half-life period. So, are you ready everybody? Are you ready? Now, rate law equation, first of all everybody is that the rate is equal to K multiplied with A to the power 0 and that is your 0th order, okay? For rate law equation, first order re reaction, you will see that it is K multiplied with A to the power 1, all right? And the rate for a second order reaction, my dear student, is going to be K multiplied with A to the power 2. Of course, of course, everybody, right? Now, the rate constant, everyone. So, K is equal to 1 divided by T multiplied with 1 divided by T multiplied with everybody. Let's start a bracket here and let's write it as A naught minus A at T. Okay, this is going to be your zero order. That means that A naught is the initial and T, at time T, what is the concentration? What is the molar concentration, right? Now, let's call this K1. That is for the first order reaction, K1. So, your K1, my dear students, is a 2.303 divided by T, yes? And then what do you do? Log A0 divided by AT, all right? Divided by AT. And finally, your K2, that means for the second order reaction, it is... 1 divided by t, yes, and then here you start the bracket, you start the bracket and then you write here 1, a, here t, minus 1 divided by a, not everybody, all right? And now, my dear students, let us go to the half life, that is t half is equal to, t half is equal to a naught divided by, oh, I have only written naught, where is my a? Nowhere. So, this is my a naught divided by 2 K, okay, divided by 2K. Second, for first order reaction, the half-life period, everybody, is T half is equal to 0 0.693 divided by K, all right? And finally, my T half is equal to 1 divided by A naught here, K. That's it. That's it, everybody. All right, yes. And now everyone, now everyone, what do we have here? So this is, again, this, this looks a little better. This is also there. You can go through this as well. This is all the, for, all the formulas plus those students who are willing to go the extra mile and study it properly. Here you also have three by fourth life. That means for the quarter life, what is the time? What is the, you know, what, what is the time that is given to you? From here, you can also find out the rate constant. From here, you can also find the molar constant concentration so please go through this tables okay it took me a lot of time it took uh you know seema ma'am who makes these slides for us seema ma'am also a lot of time to make this table and make sure that all the kids they understand at just one single time when we teach them so she, both of us you know we made some effort so please make sure that you study this okay now, what if you are not asked to find for first order or second order of a zero order, but what, what if in the question it is given to you as for nth order reaction? So, my dear students, for nth order, yes, nth order reaction, let us have a look at it. Nth order, nth order reaction. So, you have T half, yes, 
which is directly proportional to 1 divided by, what do you write here? A naught n minus 1. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. Okay. All right, everybody. Then we come across, then we come across temperature coefficient for which I have the formula here and Arrhenius equation. Your Arrhenius equation is K is equal to A e to the power minus E a divided by R t wherein you can take it as ln k is equal to minus ea divided by rt plus ln of a and then if you convert it to log you will have log k2 divided by k1 is equal to ea divided by 2.303 r 1 by t1 minus 1 by t2 all right yes everybody now what is temperature coefficient temperature coefficient is the ratio of rate constants of a reaction at two different temperatures. What did I say? The ratio of rate constants of a reaction at two different temperatures which differs by 10 degree. Which differs by 10 degree. That means on a very easy and simple way we can explain it as let's say that you have K1. Yes, you have K1 plus 10 divided by K1 and that value should be always equal to 2 to 3. It comes around 2 to 3. However, this is not majorly used. What is used is, you write it as Q10 is equal to R2 divided by R1, 10 degrees Celsius divided by T2 minus T1. This formula is very much useful, everybody. And with this note, we have come across the end of chemical kinetics. And now, my dear students, what are we going to do? We are going to have a look at equilibrium. How many chapters do we are we left with, everyone? After equilibrium, oh, that's it. We are almost done. After equilibrium, we only have atomic structure, thermodynamics, and we have a chemical bonding. That's it. That's it. That's it. Yeah. So we're almost done. Let us have a look at it. Chemical equilibrium. We are yet to, uh, you know, we are still going to write a little bit in 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 chemical equilibrium. But after that, most of the things are written for you. So what is equilibrium? Equilibrium is basically when the rate of the forward reaction is equal to rate of the backward reaction. And please mark my words, everybody. It is not that. It is not that whatever amount you have taken of the reactant and the amount of the product, they become equal. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. Hmm? It doesn't. What does it become? It's the rate that becomes equal. However, the concentrations that you have taken, the volume that you have taken, that becomes constant over the time. Okay? It becomes constant over the time. So, right here, we can write it as everybody. Right here, we can write it as, have a look, that rate of forward reaction, rate of forward reaction becomes equal to rate of backward reaction. Cool. And this is called as your equilibrium state. Okay. Now let us have a look at the concentration ratio. Okay. The concentration ratio, my dear students, is capital C to the power C, capital D to the power small d divided by capital A to the power A and capital B to the power B. Okay. All right, everybody, is this clear? Is this clear, everyone? Yes. Now, the equilibrium constant, which is K is equal to Kf or Kb. Kf is what? Cryoscopic constant. Kb is your ebullioscopic constant, right? It depends on two things. One is temperature and the other one is stoichiometry. Yes. And we all know that log of K2 divided by K1 is equal to delta S divided by 2.303 R. And then what do you do? You multiply 1 divided by T1 minus 1 divided by T2. That is your formula. This formula you have to remember. Okay. Now if two chemical reactions at equilibrium have equilibrium constants K1 and K2 and they are added then the resulting equation has the equilibrium constant K is equal to K1 minus K2 on adding. Did you get it? Just read this point. If the reaction has an equilibrium constant K1 and if you reverse it and if you reverse it, then the resulting equation has an equilibrium constant 1 divided by K1. That means everybody, that means everybody, what am I trying to say here is, let us write down the points here, okay? Point number 1 said that, point number 1 said that, okay? Point number 1 said that, if two chemical reactions at equilibrium have equilibrium constant K1 and K2, 
are added if you add those reactions then the resulting equation has equilibrium constant k is equal to k1 minus k2 understanding yes point number 7 said that let's say that you have a chemical equation which is a a plus b b gives you c c plus d d and let's say that the equilibrium constant here is k now if i reverse the reaction that means if i have c c plus d d gives us a a plus b b okay this is equilibrium right so if i write it like this then what is going to be my equilibrium constant then my equilibrium constant is going to be 1 by k are you getting it and if let's say that if we multiply the whole equation with a stoichiometry with, with a coefficient n then it is going to be raised to the power n okay for example see for example everybody so if i have this same equation the same equation what am i going to do i'm going to multiply let's say n a a plus n b b okay this gives us n c c plus n d capital d at this point so what i had was i had the equilibrium constant k but now i will have as k to the power n whatever is your coefficient just raise it to the power n that's what you are going to get everybody yes are you clear are you clear everyone yes now my dear students now my dear students for gaseous reaction if you have a gaseous reaction okay if you have a gaseous reaction so this is the concentration ratio this is the concentration ratio for gases what are you going to take for gases you're going to take the pressure so it is going to be pc raised to the power c p d raised to the power d divided by p a raised to the power a and p b raised to the power b okay this is for gas gaseous reactions okay all right everybody yes this is clear now we come across Le Chatelier's principle which tells us so here sir, there, there are certain bit of here there is a little bit of theory everybody which we will have to go through okay so Le Chatelier's principle or Le Chatelier's principle it says that change at equilibrium addition of reactant or removal of a product and what is the effect on the equilibrium you see that the equilibrium shifts forward that means that if you add more reactant or if you remove the product you see that the reaction is moving forward that means more product is forming if you add more product and if you remove a little bit of reactant, then what happens? The equilibrium shifts backward. That means more product formation is happening. Increase the pressure or if you decrease the volume, you see that the equilibrium shifts in the direction wherever there are lesser number of modes. If you increase the temperature and if you see that you have an endothermic reaction, then what will happen? Equilibrium will shift forward. If it is an exothermic re reaction, that means if it releases heat energy, then you will see that it, the equilibrium shifts backwards okay equilibrium will shift backward if you add inert gas then what will happen at constant volume no change at constant pressure equilibrium will shift to the direction whichever has more number of moles okay and if you add a catalyst no shifting only the equation is only the equilibrium will be achieved quickly that means the equilibrium will be add, uh, will be achieved faster all right everybody now this is this is a part that is from the ionic equilibrium chapter everybody so let us quickly go through this yes now if you have a mixture that is a, a strong acid and a strong base okay and let's say that x is, is equal to y here and which is ph here 7 okay ph will be here 7 if x is, is equal to y then the ph will be 7 if x is greater than y then you will calculate it as minus log x minus 1 divided by x minus y divided by b if x is lesser than y then what will you do you will take 14 minus log y minus x divided by b okay now let's say that if you have a weak acid and if you have a weak base for x is equal to y it will be 7 plus half pka minus pkb okay if there are two weak acids then it will be minus half log c1 ka1 plus c2 ka2 if it is two weak bases, then it will be 14 minus half log C1, KB1 plus C2, KB2. These are the formulas. And my dear students, we finally come across types of butter. Buffer. Butter, it seems. Types of butter. No, types of... I think I'm really hungry. Are you too? We shouldn't be. But I guess I... You know, the point is that I eat dinner very early. So, maybe that's why I'm very, very, very hungry. 
right now. Anyway, let's quickly finish it. Yeah, so we have simple buffer, okay? What is simple buffer? For simple buffer, you will see that pH is, is equal to 7 plus half, okay? You, what will you write? You will write pH is, is equal to 7 plus half, all right? Yes, everybody, are you getting this? Are you getting this? Now, pH is, is equal to 7 plus half, that's it. Nare baba, na, na, na. So what happened here is that this got exchanged. One second, I will copy a blank paper from here and I will write it in a better manner so that you have it. Huh. One second, guys, let me write this down because like I said, this happens to me, you know, this happens to me. What can I do? There is a glitch. Okay. So first of all, for simple buffer, For simple buffer, your formula is going to be pH is equal to 7 plus half pKa minus half pKb. Getting it? Okay. For acidic buffer, let's say that if you have an acidic buffer, then what are you going to do for acidic buffer? It is pH is equal to pKa plus log plus log of salt divided by concentration of acid, okay? Now, if you have a basic buffer, my dear students, then what are you going to do? If you have a basic buffer, my bachus, then you are going to do pH is equal to pKw minus, pKw means water, okay? pKw minus pKb plus log salt divided by base that's it my dear students and with this note everybody we come to the end of equilibrium now what are we going to do now we are going to take a look at atomic structure ready everybody let's go ahead and finish it after that we are only done with thermodynamics and chemical uh, bonding and we will be done with it so i think it's not going to take more time i think uh, another one and one and a half hour we will be done with it okay chalo guys now, in atomic structure, the first thing that we learn about is how to represent an element, right? So, how do you represent it? Oops, sorry, one second. Sorry, sorry. Is it coming? Ah, now it's fine? Yeah. All right. So, what you do is you represent the element with its symbol, which is X here, let's say. And then the mass number will be represented with A and the atomic number will be represented as Z as a subscript right which i'm pretty sure that you all know now what is atomic number atomic number is basically the number of protons what is mass number mass number is basically the number of protons plus number of neutrons what are isobars isobars are different atomic number but the same mass number what are isotopes they are identical atomic number but different mass number but they have the difference, yes, the difference is due to the difference of number of electrons, all right? Yes, what do they have? They have difference in number of neutrons. And finally, coming to isotones, isotones have same number of neutrons, everybody. What do they have? They have same number of neutrons, everyone. Chal. Now, my dear students, let us have a look at the Bohr's model. I'm going to move away from the screen so that you can look at this and let us have a, you know, let us study this. Okay. So, Bohr's model, how do you calculate the radius? The radius is calculated as 0 0.529 multiplied with n squared divided by z. Here, n will be the orbit and z will be the atomic number. This will be measured in angstrom, right? This is the unit. If you want to measure the kinetic energy, then the kinetic energy will be calculated as KZ squared divided by 2R, everybody. The total energy is calculated as E is equal to minus 13.6 multiplied with Z squared divided by N squared. And this is electron volt per atom. That's the unit, okay? Potential energy is nothing but minus KZ squared divided by R and velocity is calculated as 2.18 multiplied with 10 to the power 6 multiplied with z divided by n meter per second. That's the unit. And finally, everybody, as you all can see, delta E is equal to E2 minus E1 is equal to H nu, which can be written as HC divided by lambda. By the way, you also know that. Don't we also know that 
1 by lambda is equal to nu bar, right? So that means we can also write this as, as hc nu bar, okay? hc nu bar. This can also be written. All right, everybody. Now, here is a little bit derivation of the kinetic energy and the potential energy. If you clearly look at it, I believe that you will be able to understand and we have taught you this already. Yes, but here is a quick recap of the formula. So, chalo guys, yes. What is kinetic energy? As we have just discussed right now, it is Kz squared divided by 2R. Should I move this way? Yeah, I think that's better. And then potential energy is minus Kz squared divided by R. The difference is only minus half. Between kinetic energy and potential energy, the difference is only minus half. Now, the total energy, if you calculate, it will be Kz squared divided by 2R minus the potential energy because this is this has a negative sign, right? So, minus Kz squared divided by R and that will give you minus Kz squared divided by 2R. But what happens, Bachus? Let's say that what you have is, let's say you have half minus you have 1. So, if you calculate this, half minus 1, then what will you get? What will you get? It will be 1 minus 1 minus 2 divided by 2. That means it will be minus half, isn't it? So, this is exactly what you are getting here. That's exactly what you are getting, all right? Yes, so that means that potential energy is equal to twice of total energy, yes, and kinetic energy is equal to minus of total energy. Now, if we put the value of R here, then what will we get? We will get here total energy is equal to minus 2 pi square z square e to the power 4 k square m divided by n square h square, okay? Here, n, here h is your Planck's constant, okay? Now, we will quickly, quickly move to time period, okay? Time period, as we all know, it is distance divided by speed, which is equal to 2 pi r divided by uh, v, okay? Which is equal to 2 pi r divided by v. That means we can write distance is, is equal to 2 pi r, isn't it? Distance is, is equal to 2 pi r. If we want to calculate it for frequency, then my dear students, what do we have to do? If we want to calculate it for frequency, then we will calculate it as, where should I stand? I'll stand it here. Yeah, I'll stand here. Frequency is equal to 1 divided by time is equal to speed divided by distance. Is is equal to, what is speed here? Speed, as you have just calculated, uh, speed is b. And what is distance? Distance is 2 pi r. So we can write it as 1 divided by t is equal to, is equal to speed divided by distance. This is equal to V divided by 2 pi. Makes sense? 2 pi R. Makes sense? Yes. Now, delta E is equal to everyone. Delta E, the formula for delta E, that is the change in the energy is E2 minus E1 is equal to H nu is equal to HC by lambda. That means you can also write it as HC nu bar. Okay? All right. And if you solve it for lambda, okay, if you solve this whole thing for lambda, then you will get the Rydberg's formula wherein 1 by lambda is equal to nu bar is equal to rh multiplied with z square divided by di, multiplied with z square multiplied with 1 by n square minus 1 by n2 square okay all right now everybody we also know about the spectral series yes what are the series what are the names of the series you have lyman balmer Paschen, bracket fund and humphrey out of this only balmer has been discovered in the visible range apart from that rest all are in the infrared region however lyman is in ultraviolet region and fund and humphrey are in far infrared region so in this case, Lyman N1, that is the ground state for Lyman series is 1, whereas the excited states are 2, 3, 4 and infinity, right? Yes, this is an ultraviolet. Balmer is in 2. Balmer ground state is 2. The excited states are 3, 4, 5 to infinity, right? Si similarly, you can, you can have a look for Paschen, Bracket, Funds and Humphrey. All right, everybody. Now, what happens is, now what happens is, so this, this formula that we have, right, for this formula, if we substitute the values, 1 by lambda, nu bar is equal to Rh. The value of Rh is 109677 multiplied with 1 by n1 square minus 1 by n2 square centimeter to the power minus 1, okay? All right. And this can be equal to delta n multiplied with delta n plus 1 divided by 2. This is how you calculate the number of spectral lines okay so if if they may ask you that how many lines are there in Lyman how many lines are there in Balmer series how many lines are there in Paschen series if that question comes then this is the formula that you apply to calculate that okay 
Now we are going to study about de Broglie wavelength everybody. The different formulas for the wavelength are lambda is equal to h by mv and lambda is equal to h divided by root over 2 mke because because we can write it as we can write it like this okay for h by mv mv can be written as mv can be written as 2 mke root over 2 mke okay now everybody what are we going to do now we are going to simplify it and just modify it a little bit and what is it that we are going to get okay so h by root over 2 m k e right that means that that means that everybody we can also write it as lambda is equal to h divided by h divided by root over root over 2 m e v okay can we not write it like this root over 2 m that we will calculate it in electron volt right that we will calculate it in electron volt so now if we want to calculate a lambda in angstrom everyone okay if we want to calculate lambda in angstrom then what will happen is then what will happen is it we will get it as 12.3 by root over v okay 12.3 by root over v v as in frequency okay v as in frequency for an electron this is how we are going to calculate okay now in uh, in the atomic structure we also have quantum numbers yes and there are four quantum numbers what are the four quantum numbers you have principal quantum number azimuthal quantum number magnetic and spin quantum number the principal azimuthal and magnetic quantum number you get these from the schrodinger's wave equation however spin quantum number cannot be figured out from the solution of the schrodinger schrodinger wave equation if you want to calculate the number of radial nodes, that is equal to n minus l minus 1. And if you want to calculate the number of angular nodes, that's equal to l. So, total number of nodes becomes n minus l. Now, for principal quantum number, the possible values are whole numbers. That is 1, 2, 3, 4 and etc. What does it tell you? It tells you about the shell. If the principal quantum number increases, the size of the shell also increases. Getting it? Azimuthal quantum number tells you about the subshell. That means SPDF. Magnetic quantum number, it tells you about the orientation of the orbital. That means is it DXY, is it DY, Z, is it, D, uh, is, is it DXY, is it DX square minus Y square or is it PX, is it PY, is it PZ. These things you will get it from the magnetic quantum number and the spin of the electron. That is it anti-clockwise or clockwise that you will get it from the spin quantum number. Getting it my dear students? Okay. Now, electronic configuration. To understand electronic configuration, there are three rules. That is, Obo principle, Pauli's exclusion principle and Hulme's rule of multiplicity. Obo says that the orbitals are always filled in increasing order of energy. Yes, they are always filled in increasing order of energy. Okay. Hulme's rule of multipli multiplicity said that until and unless parallel, a parallel spin, that means all the orbitals are not singly occupied, pairing will not start happening. So here, if we follow the n plus l rule, everybody, we see that if the n plus l are different, greater the n plus l value, greater is the energy of the orbital. And for some odd reason, if the n plus l values are same, then what will you prefer? You will prefer, you will first fill up that orbital, which is a lower n value. That means that for 3p, for 3p and 4s, if you check, my dear students, for 3p and 4s, if you check, you will see that both of them have the same n plus l value. Okay, they have the same n plus l value. But what do we do? We fill up 3p before 4s because 3p has a principal quantum number value 3. That is why you will fill 3p first before 4s. Getting it? Yes, if the n plus l value are same, then greater the value of n, greater is the energy of the orbital. See, exactly that's what I told you. Exactly that's what I just told you. Okay, now in this case, you do not have anything else. Yes, you have uh, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. That is what delta x dot delta p is greater than equal to. You know that. You know that, right? Apart from that, is there any other formula that we are forgetting? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. We have any other formula. I think that's it. Yes. Now, guys, let us quickly go to thermodynamic processes. In thermodynamic processes, you have different set of processes such as isothermal, isobaric, isochoric, adiabatic, 
and psychic. Now, in case of isothermal, we know that the temperature remains constant throughout the process. Yes, dt is equal to 0. In case of isobaric, we know that the pressure remains constant throughout the process. dp is equal to 0. In case of isochoric, volume remains constant. Adiabatic, the system cannot exchange any heat with the surrounding at all. And in case of cyclic, a process where the initial and the final state of the system is same. And it forms a loop. It has to form a loop. If it does not form a loop, for example, if you if you say that this is a cyclic process, this, is, is this a cyclic process? If I go from A to B and if I come back this way, then the initial and the final state are the same. Yes, I can see that. But is it forming a loop? Is it going to be cyclic? No. You have to have such a reaction where you go from, let's say, A to B like this. From B to C, you go. From C to D, you come. And from D to A, you come. It has to form a loop. Only then you will call it as a cyclic process okay now in thermodynamics we come across the sign convention here so if the if 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 the system is taking in q okay if heat is absorbed by the system from the surrounding then it is going to be positive if it if the system gives away the heat that means the heat is given by the system to the surrounding then it is going to be negative if work is done on the system then it is going to be positive. If the work is done by the system, then it is going to be negative. And now, my dear students, we have all the expressions just right here made in a tabular form. All you have to do is just read them, okay? All you have to do is just read them, everyone. Chalo. Okay, so for reversible isothermal process, your W, that is work done, is equal to minus nRT ln of V2 divided by V1. And if you want to write it in terms of pressure, then you are going to write it as minus nRT ln of P1 divided by P, okay? P1 divided by P2, okay? All right, everybody? Yes, got it? Clear? Now, expression for Q, that means heat, okay? Now, Q is equal to nRT ln V2 divided by V1 and Q is equal to nRT ln P1 divided by P2 in case you want to write it in terms of pressure. Delta U is equal to NCV delta T is equal to 0. Delta H is equal to NCP delta T which is also equal to 0. The work on the PV graph, this is how you denote the graph everybody. Okay, this is how you denote the graph. Now, irreversible isothermal processes, what do you have? Work done is equal to minus p external v2 minus v1 is equal to minus p external nrt divided by p2 minus nrt divided by p1 huh? expression for q is equal to q is equal to p external v2 minus v1 and again delta u is equal to ncv delta t that is zero for that is zero here and delta H is equal to NCP delta T that will also be equal to zero. Okay. Now for isobaric process, the work done is going to be equal to minus P external V2 minus V1, which is equal to minus NR delta T. How do you write Q here? You write Q is equal to delta H, which is equal to NCP delta T and then you can write for delta U, that is internal energy change is equal to NCV delta T, right? That's how you give it, isn't it? That's how you write the expression. That will be exactly equal to NCV delta T, okay? All right, everybody. And finally, delta H is equal to NCP delta T. And in this case also, you will write it as NCP delta T, okay? Isobaric process here. That's what we spoke about. Cool? All right, everybody. But that's, is that the end of it? No. We also have isochoric process. We have reversible adiabatic process. And we have irreversible adiabatic process, everybody. So, isochoric process, W is equal to 0. W is equal to 0. Okay? All right, everyone. But Q is equal to delta U, which is equal to NCV delta T. Okay? Now, for a reversible adiabatic process, my dear Bachus, let's have a look at it. Yes, for reversible adiabatic process, does anybody know? We all know that, right? W here is equal to, my dear students, it is NCV, okay, NCV T2 minus T1, okay, which is equal to, which is equal to P2 V2 minus P1 V1 divided by Divided by what is it going to be? Divided by it is going to be gamma minus 1. Okay. Divided by 
gamma minus 1. All right, everybody. The rest you can just go through the formulas. I think I have just, I have, I have recently taught you. Just go through this. That's it. It's not so much. Okay. It's not so much. These are the formulas. Irreversible adiabatic. These, these are the only things that they are going to ask you. Nothing more than that. Now, finally, we will go to chemical bonding. In case of chemical bonding, what are the things that we have to learn? First of all, geometry in which the central atom has no lone pair. You know, I told you how to calculate it. How do you calculate it? How do you calculate it for geometry? Or steric number. You calculate it as steric number is equal to number of lone pairs plus number of surrounding atom. If you do whatever number you get, that will be your steric number. And based on the steric number, you can calculate the geometry. Yes, if there is no lone pair, then also you have to calculate it just this way. So let's say that the number of bonded electron pairs are 2, then the shape is going to be linear. Example, BeCl2, HgCl2. Right, everybody? Yes. Now, if there are 3 number of bonded pair of electron, then it is going to be trigonal planar. And molecular geometry is also going to be trigonal planar. Example is BF3. If there are four number of bonded pair of electrons, then the shape is going to be tetrahedral. Molecular geometry is also going to be tetrahedral. And example is CH4. So for, for those molecules, for those uh, molecules, if there are no, no lone pair, then the arrangement of electron pairs and the molecular geometry are absolutely same as it is. But if there are lone pair, that's when there is a twist in the story, isn't it? But we will have a look at it, a look at that as well. If there are number of bonded pair of electrons 5, that means it will be trigonal bipyramidal. Molecular geometry is also trigonal bipyramidal. Examples are PCL5, okay? If it is 6, then it is octahedral. If it is 7, then it is, you know, distorted octahedral. No? What is it? If it is 7... If it is 7, then what is it? The answer is IF7. IF7 is an example, everybody. IF7 is an example, but you tell me what is the shape. Can I get it in the comment section, everyone? Can I get it in the comment section? Will you all be able to tell me? What is it going to be? What is it going to be? Pentagonal bipyramidal. Now, about pentagon, right? You will you will make, make it in a pentagon and then there will be bipyramidal. One at the top, one at the bottom. So, it's going to be pentagonal bipyramidal, not distorted octahedral. If you thought that I was saying it right, no, I wasn't, okay? I was testing you. Okay, now if there are, let's say that if you have number of, now we have lone pair of electrons as well. Geometry in which the central atom has the lone pair of electrons. So, you have number of bonding pair 2, number of lone pair 1. It will be trigonal planar, but the shape is going to be, all you have to do is you will cover the lone pair. If you cover the lone pair, what do you see? You see a bent shape, isn't it? You see a bent shape. That's your shape. Similarly, if you have three bonding pair plus one lone pair, it will be tetrahedral, but what do you have to do? You have to cover it. You have to cover it. The moment you cover it, what do you see? Trigonal pyramidal. Similarly, for two plus two, you will have a tetrahedral shape once again. But if you cover the lone pair, which is the right here, cover the lone pair, what do you get? You get a bent shape again. Okay. So you get the point, everybody. You get the point. This is how you have to calculate it. Apart from that, in chemical bonding chapter, you have na, no other, you know, you have no other formula that I have to teach you. So with this note, we have completed all the chapters for which we had to have a look at the, for which we had to check out the formulas, everyone. With this note, let me tell you guys, in Vedantu, we have started with Vedantu daily practice problem. After every session, you get a quiz which is right below this video in the description box. Just start practicing the questions because it will be very, very, very beneficial for you. And do not forget to join the Telegram channel because you will be getting this notes also in the Telegram channel. I will provide that to you, okay? And finally, with this note, everybody, thank you so much. Do not forget to be staying. Do not forget to be a part of this channel because... Again, I will be coming up and I will tell you about the chemical, uh, inorganic chemistry exceptions. And that is also going to be very beneficial. But I will try to wrap it up in within, within one hour and I will not take too much time. So be there and I'll see you soon. Lots of love. Thank you so much for being here any which ways and all the very best for your exam. So see you guys. Bye.